playful this semester in kind of setting up our um, interdisciplinary exchanges near kind of cultural marks. Um, so we have our, our interdisciplinary exchange on marijuana near 420. Um, I don't know if anybody thought about it, but we did. Um, so we have three speakers today, one of whom is going to be a little late, um, but he will be here. So first, I think Vanessa Fishback is going to be our first speaker. She's an instructor in the Department of Chemistry and director of the Biochemistry Program. Our second speaker is going to be Esther Sullivan, who is an urban sociologist and assistant professor of sociology. And I just learned that she is among the first class of the TIAA sponsored Chancellor's Engaged Fellows, and these are faculty who are doing particularly important um, and interesting work in the community. Um, so congratulations, Thanks. Esther, on that. That's really <laughs> and, and welcome panelists. So we'll get going. And they're each going to speak for about 10 minutes, uh, and then we'll have Q&A, and then we'll have lunch. We make you wait for lunch. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so even though it says campus chemistry, I promise you there's like no chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> there's not a single chemical structure in this. So I just wanted to like kind of present a kind of a big overview so everybody's on the same page. So let's just go. Oh, and it's four myths busted and 20 fun facts for 420. Right? Okay, so it's a, it's a plant. It's a really, really old plant. It's been around forever. And the closest, uh, its first cousin plant is hops. And hops are what you put in beer, and it's what makes beer bitter, right? So, been around. All right, the reason we're interested in it, everybody knows about THC, that's psychoactive, that's a cannabinoid. And then there's another um, cannabinoid that's really important, which is called CBD. And CBD is not psychoactive, but has therapeutic uh, potential, right? And the other thing is we're also interested in raw material that comes from hemp plants because that can be used to make fibers, ropes, all sorts of stuff, oil, everything. Okay, first myth, marijuana is not a synonym for cannabis and vice versa. They're two completely different things. The plant is the cannabis official title, Cannabis Sativa L plant. Marijuana refers to the plant material that's greater than 0.3% THC by dry weight. And hemp refers to plant material that is less than 0.3% THC by dry weight. All right, so you want to actually use the word cannabis if you're talking about the whole kit and caboodle. All right, hemp is now legal. So the farm bill that passed in December of 2018 um, legalized hemp as an agricultural crop, right? And it has to be state licensed and regulated, and the state of Colorado is working out the details on that one. And however, marijuana, as previously just defined, is still considered a Schedule I uh, controlled drug at the federal level, right? Now, hemp actually was a mandatory crop during colonial era because of making ropes and fiber and stuff like that. And then they instituted a marijuana tax in 1937 that made it difficult for people to actually grow hemp, so it kind of faded out. And then there was a research industry during World War II to make rope, and then they closed down the hemp uh, factories like production type factories after that. And then in 1970, it all went dark with the Controlled Substance Act and it was Schedule One. So, and now it's just kind of come back. So, long, long time there. All right, CBD, however, is not legal because you can extract CBD from hemp and you can extract CBD from marijuana. So it's legal if you extract it from hemp, and it's illegal if you extract it from marijuana. Okay. So that's kind of like a little vague area. All right, so cannabis is like this total little chemical factory. There's over 500 different organic compounds. 
the, the plant produces that it does not need officially to like live itself as a plant and reproduce as a plant. Right? So we divide these up into a couple categories. We have the terpene category, we have the cannabinoid ca category, and then all the other junk we just kind of lump into everything else. And this little factory where it makes all this stuff, so it's got like the enzymes that you need to make it all, all the raw materials you need to make it all, and all the stuff that you actually make are in these little things called glandular trichomes. And this picture over here is an uh, electron um, microscope photos of those. So it has like the little stalks with the little bulb on the top, and that's just full of the stuff. And that grows on in the flowers, and it grows on the leaves as well, to some extent. All right, terpenes. Terpenes are a huge class of chemical compounds, and they provide the flavor profile for plants and fruits and stuff like that. So pretty much anything that you eat that comes from the ground or tree is going to have terpenes in it, and that generates what your perception of the taste and aroma is. And so this is just a couple of examples. Fruits, herbs, all of this stuff. So cannabis has all of these compounds as well, and that's what generates the different smells of different strains of cannabis. All right, cannabinoids, on the other hand, don't have a smell. They're bigger, bigger organic compounds. They're, they're, um, they're made from a terpene feedstock plus a different <coughs> compound that the plant makes, and then the plant makes of all of these different cannabinoids. And there's like around 113 of them, the main ones being the THC one and the CBD. But there's other ones as well. All right, so they, they both have the same parent compound. So it's two completely different pathways that are controlled by different enzymes. So there's also different enzymes that make up the terpenes. So if you can control your enzyme production, you can control what your cannabinoid and terpene profile is going to look like. And it changes from strain to strain, it changes from plant to plant, it changes based on your growing conditions, it changes based on just about any, everything and anything that you do. So quality control can be challenging. Each cannabinoid actually has two forms. It has an acidic form and a neutral form. And the form that we want is the neutral form. And the conversion from the acidic form to the neutral form, it does happen to some extent in the plant with enzymes. But mostly it happens by heat. And um, in terms of the technology of making products that consumers consume, there's usually heat involved somewhere along the line to get it to be in a neutral form, right? So that's the decarboxylation stage. What people do is they crossbreed like crazy to get what they want in terms of cannabinoid um, level. So right now people crossbreed to get high THC, so it's up to like 25% THC and even higher versus 4% like in the 1970s. And then you can also crossbreed to get like 100% like where you're, you're extracting for CBD and you're way below that 0.3% THC. So you're definitely in hemp land, so you're legal. And you can crossbreed for terpene profile as well. Once you get that job all done and you get what you like, you clone, which is uh, biology for take a cutting. Right? You take a cutting and you stick it in the rooting hormone and you grow in a, a new plant. So it's not like there's other ways you can do that, but that's the main way. All right. If um, you are familiar or, or as a consumer, if you go to the store, the bud tenders are going to tell you all about sativa and indica. There's actually three original ones, which was indica, sativa, and ruderalis, which is the wild type and then sativa and indica were more like farm varieties. Now, in the old days, and probably still some today, sativa was called low THC and cannabis was the high THC. But in reality, from a chemical point of view, there's no difference between those two, right? Um, they, they, you can have high THC <coughs> in anything, you can have high CBD in any one of those, you can have different terpene profiles. All right. 
Um, our bodies were made for this. We have uh, receptors in our bodies for these kinds of compounds, right? There's CB1 and CB2, plus our bodies makes their own cannabinoids. So the two that we know about right now are andamid and 2-AG, and they interact with the receptors in our body and do physiological things. Um, and there's like, uh, CB1 is mostly about all neural stuff, and CB2 is mostly all about immune system stuff, right? And um, so both THC and CBD um, interact with those receptors, and the consequences of all of those interactions are that you're going to have physiological effects. So there's a lot of research going on in that. You can collate some of the physiological properties of each of these main cannabinoids, right? We'll go through, and then what I want to do is talk about this. Uh, health effects of cannabis. Well, it turns out that the National Academy of Sciences did a giant meta-study and published this up at the end of 2017, and it covers the entire literature from 2011 through that end of 2016, and these are their key findings. Um, Anti-emetics, good, reduces pain, good, MS, and reduces spasticity, good, and we need to do a lot more research, right? And we also do sell, actually, um, cannabinoid drugs on the market, Marinol, Sativex and Epidiolex. Epidiolex is the newest one. It just got FDA approved recently. And our control substances uh, act, Schedule 1, is defined as high potential for abuse, currently now accepted medical treatment, and uh, lack of safety, accepted safety. At the, and, and marijuana, T, defined as having THC, is a um, Schedule 1 drug. Federally, and the WHO said it should actually be a Schedule 4, and they said that in 20, 2003, and here we are, still waiting. <laughs> All right, so that got me my 12 minutes. <laughs> All right, not too bad. All right. Great, thank you. I think over here is good. Hi, how are you? <laughs> I'm gonna sit. Pause <laughs> for okay. technical. I'm gonna sit up here next to this computer. Cool. Are we going with that? No, we're not going yet. Um, great. Yes. Um, so I'm gonna present a paper that is absolutely a work in progress, a working paper with emphasis on working. And um, um, my my co-author on this paper is Rodney Herring in English, who's here also. Um, so our collaboration is an interdisciplinary, a very interdisciplinary uh, collaboration. Um, I'm a sociologist, I'm an urban sociologist, and I study housing, um, especially like uh, socio-legal approaches to housing, so I'm interested in, in housing regulation. And that seems very far removed from cannabis, but when I moved to Colorado, I became interested in um, residential relocation and mobility occurring alongside um, cannabis legalization. So states where cannabis becomes legal, how does that affect population growth and change? And then I became more and more interested in just general kind of cultural shifts occurring alongside cannabis legalization. And Rodney is um, a professor of rhetoric. He studies the history of rhetoric, especially um, economic rhetorics, right? And um, both of us were kind of became interested in uh, kind of the economic rationalities that occur within the cannabis industry, especially as they relate to messaging and rhetorics around um, just the legitimacy of the industry. So we got one of these um, CRC grants from ORS, which is like a collaborative grant. It's a grants that bring um, faculty from across the university together from different disciplines. And so we're also kind of interested in bringing the tools and perspectives of both of our disciplines to bear on a central research question. Um, and so that grant allowed us to interview 38 cannabis industry insiders, and these were um, policy analysts, lawyers, and paralegals, 
um, business owners, compliance officers, and also we selected interviewees from some of the key organizations that uh, kind of underlie the whole um, recreational legalization process in Colorado. These organizations are the Marijuana Policy Project, MPP, and the Drug Policy Alliance, DPA. These are national organizations that had local chapters in Colorado. So we interviewed um, top uh, people in top positions at both DPA and MPP. MPP supplied 90% of the funding for the um, Amendment 64 initiative. Um, DPA basically supplied the funding and the personnel for the Amendment 20 medical marijuana initiative. Um, we also interviewed lawyers um, and paralegals in um, two of the top cannabis business law firms, which are Hoden, uh, Hoban Law Group and Vincente Cedarberg, who actually, which is the law group that actually wrote the legal language of Amendment 64. And then from there, we snowballed the sample and we just interviewed a range of people. Um, entrepreneurs, compliance officers, um, business owners, both dispensaries and grows, and MIPS, which are the, uh, the regulations require that marijuana infused products like um, edibles and tinctures and all those are in a separate facility. So owners of facilities like that. Um, and also marketers and um, advocates and some employees, but only those with direct experience with compliance and regulation. So our research design, um, well, before I get there, our research design reflected our interdisciplinary collaboration. And so we were both interested in sociological issues related to um, stakeholder strategies around legalization, both before, during, and after the Amendment 64 ballot initiative, which, which legalized recreational cannabis. Um, and we were also interested in rhetorical issues of narrative and metaphor and persuasion. So throughout this process, I learned that rhetoric is not just language. Rhetoric is language that is directed toward an audience in the effort to persuade, which actually that's really a sociological, that's kind of a sociolog sociological object of analysis because it's about interaction. Um, so our research questions really highlighted that we ask how do these industry insiders understand, experience, and work with legal regulation? And then how do they frame their understandings of Colorado's regulatory structure? Um, so the project is theoretically grounded in the sociological view that becoming legal requires that activists and stakeholders shape and respond to stories and ideas and narratives around you know, what is legality, right? It's like the social construction of legality. Um, and regulation is really important in this process of law because regulation is what transforms law into, you know, from a, from a kind of broader system of norms, uh, a symbolic system into actual regulation on the ground. So it kind of operationalized, regulation operationalizes law. You can think of it like that. And um, so there's this objective function of regulation um, to transform law into specific outcomes. So we focused in on those processes and explored how Colorado's regulatory structure became kind of a focal point where all of these stories and myths and narratives about legality and what is legal become embedded. So our main finding, uh, it's an emerging finding, it's a working <laughs> paper, uh, is that industry actors use the regulatory pro process for both instrumental, uh, so strategic, instrumental, and also symbolic outcomes. So we found that there are discourses of regulation all over these stakeholders talk about legalization. Um, and that these discourses were employed both strategically and symbolically to early on gain public support for legalization before Amendment 64 was on the ballot, to bolster political support at that critical phase when, when people went to vote, and then to construct the legitimacy of the industry uh, after Amendment 64 was passed. So I'm gonna talk briefly about these kind of three turning part points when regulation, when talk of regulation was really important for the stakeholders that we interviewed. Gaining support for Amendment 64, creating the state policies during the Amendment 64 task force, which was basically a regulatory process in which stakeholders and policymakers collaboratively came
came up with the regulations, regulations that structure our Colorado industry. And then sustaining investment in the, in the industry after uh, Amendment 64 was passed, which is now, right? Um, so I'll talk about these in terms of formulating the message, popularizing the message, and then sticking to the message. And I'm going to bring up, by way of conclusions, some contributions or some uh, contradictions that that implies. So in terms of formulating the message, um, the rhetoric of the Amendment 64 ballot campaign leading up to the vote on Amendment 64, it was spearheaded by these two primary national organizations that then worked in Colorado and had tons of people on the ground and local chapters here in Colorado. Wow. <laughs> you saw I was trying so hard. Okay. Uh, so, so these organizations are these, right? The DPA and the MPP. Um, our respondents within these organizations told us that, or, or showed us, let us know, that the focus on regulation that we heard so often through our interviews was not like the first or most natural choice for these advocates. So Frank, a former director um, of the Colorado Office at Drug Policy Alliance, told us that really social justice and criminal justice reform was why he came into this and it was the national organization's primary focus um, during Amendment 20 and then leading into Amendment 64. He said, it was our job and my job to put the issue of marijuana legalization under the broader umbrella of criminal justice reform and speak about criminal justice and about racial disparities. And in fact, one about a fifth of our, like 20% of our, our respondents um, told us that, that social justice was their primary motivation for becoming involved. But when I asked Frank, okay, so how did all of this, this social justice um, inform the process leading from Amendment 20 to 64? He says, well, we highlighted the fact that at the time we had the only non-profit or for-profit highly regulated medical marijuana framework in the country. We use that to say that we're going to do the same thing. We're not going to try to reinvent the wheel. We're going to follow on the heels of that success in Amendment 20 and just tweak it a little. So you heard that throughout the campaign. Regulate like medical MJ, marijuana. And that was our calling card. And similarly, in MPP, Victor um, told us the same thing, that at the beginning of the Amendment 64 campaign, the message wasn't about regulation at all. But then uh, MPP funded some testing, some focus group testing, testing around um, the messages, and they, they, they tested these focus groups before, during, and after they saw an ad campaign. And this, isn't, this, this is a quote, but it's not up there. Uh, Chris, a campaign manager, uh, tells us that out of this testing came three frames that are still important. Regulate, like alcohol, because that gives voters a sense that there'll be some kind of framework. Tax, because again, that gives the, a construct to the voter that it's going to be regulated. And the black market, so take it out of the cans of criminals, and out of that came the basic notion of legalize, regulate, and tax. So from one that was initially focused on kind of like the risks involved in, um, in marijuana compared to other substances, so there was, there was the safer message, marijuana is safer than alcohol, and they transformed the message into the campaign to regulate marijuana like alcohol. So you saw posters like, or billboards like this going up around Colorado, right? The message is not just, I prefer marijuana over alcohol, but this is funded by the campaign, this is funded by MPP, and it's not amendment64.org, instead it's regulatemarijuana.org. And this also informed the legal language on the ballot initiative, which became an amendment providing for the regulation of marijuana. So because I have zero time, I'll just, uh, I'll just say that this actually produces some interesting contradictions. Uh, and I'll only talk about one. Um, because I had, I had time to talk about the social justice message that kind of brought people to um, their activism around marijuana, cannabis. And, uh, but the, the emphasis on regulation produce this massive regulatory framework in Colorado. And so the social justice message kind of got lost in that. And that's very different from processes that occurred in other states like California, where the social justice message uh, remained important throughout the ballot initiative process. It wasn't like regulation was seen as the primary thing that was gonna sway public opinion. 
And there in California, the social justice message remains important in the legal framework that they then uh, instituted. So for instance, in, in um, Colorado, a felony bars you from employment anywhere in the cannabis industry. Whereas in California, they created a regulatory structure that actually promotes um, those with, uh, with felony, with drug convictions to become owners um, of uh, marijuana companies, dispensaries, grows, right? And so this kind of issue of rhetoric has actual objective outcomes. Uh, it shapes the, the laws that we then, the legal structures that we then uh, institute. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Are you ready? <laughs> I should start warning in the initial email. Ten minutes is faster than you've ever imagined. Yes, so our final speaker today is um, Marty Tanya, uh, who is from Anthropology, and he is an associate professor, I believe. Yes, it's not in your bio here. Um, so he will be talking for ten minutes. I'm just reminding you. <laughs> um, and then we'll have time for Q&A. All right. Go. All right. Hey, everybody. Hi. Um, Dangerous. Uh, I apologize uh, for being late um, and missing your talk. And it's so exciting. I'm totally stoked to be here. I can potentially see this as like the beginning of maybe a working group to make sure that CU Denver plays a greater role in the global cannabis sector. Okay. And I really have one message that I'm going to bring to you today. But it's simply. <laughs> How do we um, best be helpful to ensure that workers who devote their labor to the production of cannabis get a fair wage and share in the wealth? Real simple, okay? So I'll go through the few slides, and this is to promote uh, the future. Um, University of uh, Colorado Denver, I see it playing a huge role, and this is called culture jamming. You mix two things that normally don't go together. So this is part of sort of the post-prohibition era and the normalization of cannabis. So as a grad student, I spent three years as a full-time organizer of grad students. And in California, when I finished, I was part of the um, uh, bargaining team at the um, university level and then at the system-wide level. We got one of the best contracts for graduate students in the universe. Um, so this greatly shaped my approach to research and anthropology. Um, I have a course coming up. I'll be in Holland uh, promoting a course and uh, knowledge about hemp culture. And also I just proposed a course to the Office of Global Education about nutrition and food as medicine. And if things go well, we'll be visiting a hemp farm in Malawi. Um, another course with uh, people in the uh, Dean's office, Kristen, Laurel Dodds, um, I'm trying to have an antidote to industry-driven courses that promote um, workers' health without addressing labor rights issues. So I have a course, if things go well, it's going to come up in August in collaboration with UFCW, which is one of the organizing uh, unions, to ensure workers have their fair share of the wealth uh, in the cannabis sector. Mm -hmm. So my research, essentially looking at um, health and safety, workers' rights, unionization, I do look at the phony corporate social and environmental responsibility schemes and community engagement plans Companies say they care about things, but in actual practices in their own houses where they produce cannabis, they will obstruct workers' rights and not pay fair wages. Um, and so that's a big problem. And so I have a publication just submitted, two publications that deal with these issues. Um, and then also the library here, we have one of the best collections in the universe of cannabis popular publications, magazines. And so I'm writing a manuscript about the, the collection. Um, here's me collecting air samples to quantify the number of mold spores that cannabis workers get exposed to. So I'm in the middle of writing that up. So some context. Major change is happening with globally affluent investors and entrepreneurs. This is a monstrous industry. Pales in comparison to tobacco um, and alcohol, but it still uh, has quite a bit of influence. And here's just a couple numbers. Uh, the Euro Monitor estimates that in 10 years we'll have full legalization in the US. I think there might be people, people in this room, and I know people outside this room that want to see that sooner. Uh, and so we should be prepared for that. And it's perfectly normal, in, in my opinion, recognizing that there's going to be health consequences and other issues we've got to deal with. Now, when you integrate the illegal market, it's a, even more monstrous, $150 billion. 
And in terms of jobs, again, I'm looking at um, uh, nationwide, not just Colorado, 21,000 or 211,000. Um, jumps to about 300,000 when you include ancillary businesses. And so we have a problem where workers are underpaid, okay? It's not specific to the cannabis industry. I bet if we ask people in the University of Colorado, Denver, they'll say they're underpaid. Uh, but the point is, as academic people and, and activists, uh, what can we do to ensure people are getting a fair um, a wage and sharing in the wealth? Okay, if you just, bottom line here, a trimmer receiving 30000 a year would have to work eight, almost 18 years to um, uh, make the equivalent of one of the CEOs of one of these big companies. This is becoming normalized at the global level in the sense that industry people are meeting with uh, government officials to begin to plan for trade regulations about this, um, this commodity. And so in Davos, Switzerland, there's discussions in February, former statesman and then an entrepreneur. So there's now a relationship developing and has been developing at the global level. And so I think we as researchers, academic activists, should try to be at the table to ensure we can direct some of the uh, discussions. So my findings, basically, again, if you ask any worker, they're going to tell you there's problems. I didn't go in there telling me about how much you love your job. I was interested in what I can do to understand and educate myself about working conditions. Exposure to powdery mildew was one of the biggest problems. A farm owner said Colorado has an epidemic of powdery mildew, and many of the workers I talked to won't even buy or consume the product in the places they work because they see so much powdery mildew go to the shelves. Uh, labor violations, since 13, there's been 11 almost 50% of those in Colorado. Um, but what's more important about doing documents research, you get to learn on the right side which organizations are um, anti-union, anti-worker organizations. So as campaigners for social justice, we have to figure out how to use that information and organize uh, appropriately. Labor uh, peace agreements is like the natural next step. California, two other states have these. Um, the problem is the industry doesn't like this idea of having an agreement where it's a, like a path toward unionization. These uh, groups, which all have community engagement plans, corporate social responsibility plans, spend a lot of money to obstruct legislation that could help unionization and workers' rights. <clears throat> they spend, uh, last year, um, these are the amounts, 2018, uh, the first three months, 2019, almost two-thirds of what they spent last year. Again, these are some of the culprits. Now, social justice. Cannabis is doing some incredible work to promote social justice. But the bottom line, literally, on the slide, is that you won't get them to talk about labor rights and unionization. And so there's limits of social justice in the cannabis sector, and so if anything, you know, ask um, when you go, if you go into these places, um, do you like working here? Um, have you guys thought about unionization? And so this to me is a huge problem. So recognizing the boundaries of uh, social justice in the cannabis sector and how much we need to move the goalposts. Now, my last slide is, I've been very fortunate to be a producer at Denver Open Media. I have a television show. Um, called Getting High on Anthropology. Uh, Art here has been one of the guests. And Art, by the way, is also a filmmaker in Cam, and he's doing a documentary about hemp. And um, we just got a Europe, or he just got a Europe uh, grant. And you should check out the film. I think I'm in the film, right? <laughs> so I, I recommend you check it out. Um, and again, I want to thank the university, the dean's office, others for creating a climate for us to do this kind of stuff. But there's a lot of work to be done and not just academic publications, but uh, like in the trenches, building community and making sure that the wealth from cannabis is uh, spread uh, more widely. That's it. because I, I lived there a while ago. I haven't kept up with all their policies, but when I lived there, it was a very different type of uh, use, it, only in the shops where you could come in and use it. So have things changed, or what do you expect to learn from them? So I also lived in the Netherlands. I got a master's from the Hague in uh, labor studies. Um, so that's one of the reasons I'm going back, because I love it. Um, so they have um, a system. They're the eighth largest hemp producer in the world. And so their main focus, unlike Colorado, is um, uh, building materials um, and trying to have this idea of a circular economy 
for us to get away from single-use plastics. And so when we're there, students are going to look at the different segments of the uh, global production of industrial hemp. So farm, manufacturing, and then consumption. So I think if anything, we're just going to educate ourselves about uh, different opportunities. And it's not like, oh, let's go to the you know, red light district and go to coffee shops, which is what most American tourists, um, again, to generalize, that's sort of what they do. Yeah, the Dutch say that it's just tourists who go to the coffee shops. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I had a question regarding, um, so am I wrong, is there, is the research in cannabis really regulated? Like as far as like, not the health, but like as far as like production and... Don't get me started. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, so um, this is the problem. You cannot, it's a, because it's Schedule 1 federal, so, um, if you're an institution that receives federal funds, you have to have a license to deal with um, a Schedule One drug to do any research, say, on campus. So you have to do that process, which is not timely. And then the other worst process is there's a federal monopoly on product all of the product comes from one place, which is the University of Mississippi, and it has since 1968. And that the stuff they make is under contract from NIDA, and the last contract was for 800 kilos. Um, they're still sitting on some of that 800 kilos, and they harvested in 2013 or something was their last harvest. So. And that product resembles um, product from the 1970s. It does not resemble current product at all. And this is a huge kerfuffle that's going on that is a real roadblock. So I know that um, you know about Reach Up and Boulder Campus has an initiative where they're trying to get um, the state government to work on having opportunities to get more product. So those of people in the academic community who want to do more research can actually get something to do research with. Because right? that's like a, the real, it's a, you know, a lot of this um, papers that we talk about in my class, they're all international papers. Well, let me, let me add to that. Um, because I tend to take a few more risks, I always have to talk to legal counsel in the university. So the University of Colorado wants cannabis research. And they're there to help you to make sure you can be creative and get the necessary data to the federal government to ensure that the landscape is there where they can legalize marijuana. I'm not suggesting that the University of Colorado is promoting the legalization across the board. What they're doing is they recognize we're in the cycle that 95% of all the published research says how bad cannabis is for you. But we don't know the effects like cannabis is medicine and all this other stuff. So, so there's a climate here where the IRB is there to help you to overcome this, the, all, all these um, hoops, but you also have to be willing to work up to two years to, to get mm -hmm. uh, things cleared. The second point is I'm blown away at how creative researchers are. So there's a woman, in fact, in my course for the Maymester, um, Ashley, uh, Professor Ashley Brooks Russell, she has an apartment um, sanctioned by CU um, Andrews campus where she brings in people who consume weed and they get in simulators and drives so they come up with a formula to figure out what's the appropriate um, you know mechanism to determine if someone's under the influence um, and then also there's this like van a cannabis van or something in Boulder where scientists pull up to your place you consume and they do all these um, tests to determine um, you know how, how high or whatever you are so uh, I think we're forced to be creative uh, but again, working uh, across disciplines, which many of us do, and then also recognizing uh, it takes a lot of patience to do this. Yeah, thing. and the way, with human subjects, the way that, that um, researchers are getting around this is instead of actually like distributing cannabis or, or giving, they, they just get people who already take cannabis. So they enroll people, and then they take the research to them. So like, instead of, um, yeah, having to like in a lab setting uh, give cannabis, which is impossible. They simply are getting people that are already on a regimen where they're they know what they're dosing and they know what they're using every day, and then they um, 
bring them into the study. That's what the band does, basically. Mm -hmm. I, I actually grew up about a half hour from the University of Mississippi, and so <laughs> they're like farm. Um, many times, and but one of the things that Esther and I heard a number of times during our uh, interviews was this sort of narrative that like, yeah, there's no research, it's crap weed that they get from the University of Mississippi, and it's the only sort of sanctioned research opportunity. So aside from potency, is there, I mean, is it crap weed? Um, I, I, I oh, the federal, is, the federal like, weed? Is that a narrative, yeah. or is it? The federal um, weed is, um, it, um, it's old, so the cannabis profiles are all different, okay. the terpene profiles are all, all different. Would they process it more quickly? And it's, Would it be better research? Well, what they need to do is actually grow plants that are the same plants as okay. what people are selling. So the way you get around all of this now is um, there are some people who do have federal licenses and so they go and buy product at dispensaries and then they can do testing, laboratory testing on those products. Uh -huh. And then there's a lot of research that's been done in other countries. So like Israel is like a big, there's a big thing there um, that's like huge. And uh, Europe, lots of EU countries have like big, big research groups. Uh, the biochemistry thing is super hot because you can synthesize cannabinoid derivatives and test those against receptors and look at exactly how the receptor works using those compounds because those compounds are legal compounds. So there's a lot of that. And uh, there's two people, Daniela Vergara and Nolan Kane at Boulder. They publish extensively doing the profiling, systematically looking at it. And what's so funny, when you have a room full of researchers that some use the weed from Mississippi and some didn't, they don't like each other because <laughs> people recognize the weed from Mississippi is just such crap. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of understood you know, among people in this area. But if you have these limited... Uh, constraints, some people say, well, let's just use it anyway because that's sort of like the mainstream weed available. And, I know. And, and, and so it's a, it's yeah. a, things are changing though because the industry is pushing and other people are pushing uh, so we can ensure that the quality of the weed is what the industry is producing, which is like off the charts about whether THC content or what particular strain works for menstrual cramps or whatever. Like it's, it's, it's a science that um, I think is exciting, but again, uh, could lead to some potential public health problems. Yeah, and it's like the wild, wild west in terms of there's no oversight of laboratories, there's no agreement on methods, what methods are gonna be used, there's no agreement on what pesticides should we screen for, what's the tolerance levels, what, or anything. So when you go to the store, how do you know the THC level is what you're, you're purchasing? You're just assuming there's some level of okayness there, but there's nobody to oversee any of it yet. It's just kind of all burbling up. Well, but for what we found is that there's a ton of testing being done. I mean, so much entrepreneurs. testing, but it's just, but, yeah, they're testing entrepreneurs. I mean, they're creating their own mm -hmm. labs. I mean, but it's not academic. Statewide regulation of that requires testing. Right? Yeah, exactly. Um, so it is kind of hodgepodge. So it's being done in all these different ways, and actually, it's almost being done with like a eye towards over compliance. But it's just that there's no standard of what that compliance should be, um, and also the testing is not geared towards like scientific knowledge. The testing is more geared towards capitalism. How can we create the best yeah, yeah, strand or create the highest <laughs> level of THC or whatever it is? And maybe limit our liability if a customer right. mm -hmm. overdoses or something. Yeah, exactly. Oh, I scare quotes, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, because like what you were saying about the mold. So there's like 38 page list of approved pesticides for Colorado. And so you can use any of that for all sorts of stuff. So you get like, so the people who work in the greenhouses are going to be exposed or that they, the pesticide appliers are going to be exposed. They have a little training class where they talk about PPE for those people, um, but I believe it's like a little like four hour max workshop 
that you go to get your license to be a pesticide applier. You know, so they don't, those people are not, it's not really like big training. Jana has a question. Esther, what, what, why do you think um, the California messaging stayed with social justice, whereas the Colorado messaging from the industry went so quickly to regulation? Well, I think it's because they saw, they, they tested the message and they believed they found what worked. Would you agree with that? I mean, they said repeatedly, like, what worked was highlighting that we're going to have a highly regulated market. And that's why I kind of talked about that, the actual focus groups and the message testing and what came out of that. They, they called it the tax and regulatory campaign. And so I think that they took that and they ran with it. And um, what was different, do you think, about California? Well, I think throughout California, throughout the campaign, and then after California highlighted that social justice component. I mean, why do I think that's different? I would have to think more about that, but it could be because of California's history. I mean, California has a history of cooperative um, mm -hmm. grows of like come on, more like collectivist and communitarian like uh, uses of cannabis, um, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, what? To, to add to that, um, underneath the veneer of the Colorado's <laughs> cannabis capitalism, um, you have a history where industry people basically designed and implemented the regulatory framework. So I've talked to public health people, I've talked to um, other people that have suggested, unlike other states, California in hindsight got a chance to learn from, from Colorado. But yeah. California, Colorado, you had public health people that naturally played a role, but they didn't have the knowledge like the industry people. So the industry people played a huge role in, I think, not only the discourse, but making sure the, at the beginning the regulations were weak and diluted to ensure that in the short term they can make a lot of money. And there's even um, uh, people talking about how there were meetings at the Colorado Department of Agriculture where they're arranging to do testing and then the industry sort of refused unless they were uh, to, to provide samples unless they were very clear what was going to be tested. So through these ongoing discussions that were happening in 15 and 16, the industry asserted themselves to ensure there weren't too many obstacles for them to um, do what they need to do. And Marty, you went to, was it 96 when, uh, was it Prop 301 or whatever? In California? But, yeah. So there's a nearly 20 year history of operating um, medical marijuana, cooperative, very diffuse, um, whereas, like, although we passed Prop tw or, uh, Amendment 20 in 2000, like, everything was, nothing operated at the level of, at the high level of activity in Colorado. Um, and then in, I think it was 2009, um, the Ogden memo came down from the uh, Obama Department of Justice and said, like, it's, it's okay, we're not gonna prosecute you if you have a regulatory framework in place. And Colorado was like, oh my God, we don't. And, um, and so there was a real counter scam there. So I think there's just like a really compressed history and a lower level of activity in Colorado. And then, yeah. California learned from Colorado and Washington, who did it differently. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, right now you can buy kind of a strain of sour diesel from 20 different dispensaries mm -hmm. and you're going to get 20 different plants. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you guys could talk about kind of the regulation of strains and how that works. They're all kind of labeled the same, but they're all uniquely different. There isn't any. Yeah. <laughs> so buyer beware, but you're exactly correct. There's no guarantee that a sour diesel in place A is going to be the same as sour diesel in place B. But a lot of greenhouses do clone, so if you find something you like from a particular dispensary, you can ask them who they purchase from at the wholesale level, and then you, then you can like stay with that wholesaler. That's about as good as it gets right now for quality control. And definitely look at the Kane Lab at CU Boulder. They published, they did that, they went to different places and, and then analyzed mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the profiles. And I, I think it's like an interesting question because 
you know, if you look at Pepsi and Coke and, and all the knockoffs, it's like you can't really say there's one formula and the plan itself is so complex. And, and I think what's worrisome is at the national and other levels, the, um, the idea of patenting um, cannabis. That is, is, is troubling. And that's something that is all along the lines of big cannabis and commodification. Um, and so these are some things that are, um, in fact, I, I'm having a guest speaker, Angela Baca from Oregon, and she's following the FDA meetings. A lot of this stuff is hung up because of the FDA and of course the Schedule One stuff, uh, but there's gonna be a re-examination of CBD uh, in terms of FDA in May, and that's gonna determine some of these things about whether patenting and all the other opportunities, of course, limitations of doing cannabis research and um, commercialism. So pay attention to the CBD discussion, FDA at the end of uh, May. But people would like to patent their um, plants. I'm curious if you could each talk about um, what do you think, what kind of changes would you like to see in your respective areas, labor, social justice, chemistry, research, um, and if there are any models to look at in other states or other countries that you're sort of inspired by, what would be your dream scenario for the future? Well, like for the chemistry part, so my class, as far as I've been able to make out from going to conferences and stuff, so this class is the first chemistry class at a four-year or any kind of academic, upper-level academic school. And the reason that I wanted to do it is uh, I know the plant, I knew the plant chemistry. It's a great vehicle for chemistry in general, but there's also like this business opportunity. I mean, that here it is, all this stuff coming along, and if people don't know anything, then how do you do like run the labs, work in the labs, product develop, you know, or, or how do you build alternatives and stuff like that? And we're kind of behind the rest of the world and how we look at this stuff. But we were the first to have it like decriminalized. So we should be the first in terms of academic leadership on this. And so it just seems like that should be a natural. I might not have like a, a, a answer about like a ideal regulatory structure, but your question made me think of just in my other study of cannabis movers, uh, the interviews that I'm doing there make me realize like how profound this is for some people and how profound access to cannabis is in their lives and the things that they're willing to give up, which is truly unbelievable. I mean, I thought I was going to go into this study and just hear a bunch of stories about how cannabis cures cancer and blah, blah, blah. But it's like these people give up their families, their children. Uh, and like some other, they'll, they'll move with one of their kids that's epileptic and have to leave behind their other two kids. I mean, they're not like, a lot of them are not like wealthy middle class people. They're giving up jobs and retirements and all kinds of things to move here to Colorado to be able to access this plant. And that makes me think that there should be some type of parity statewide so that people aren't having to do this. So um, remember the acronym TCC, Transdisciplinary Cannabis, oh, TCS, Can Transdisciplinary <laughs> Cannabis Studies for my discipline, my department, my college, the CU system, a um, bachelor's program, certificate program, where we provide opportunities for students to do research. We work together with people in the dean's office and get North Classroom to be a pilot, I'm sorry, the roof of North Classroom to be a farm where we can learn how to create the necessary strains that might be a resistant to powdery mildew. And we make sure that CU plays a greater role in education, but also ensuring that the landscape where decisions are made about cannabis, that it's done appropriately, fairly, and in a, in a transparent uh, manner. So TCS, uh, watch for it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's end there.